uh, and uh, you know, uh, that will be fine. But I wanted to just take the opportunity to do a very quick introduction to Professor Adam Enders. He is a, a, a professor, assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Louisville, uh, Michigan State PhD. Uh, great for like these Midwest connections from uh, our way back. Uh, he also teaches at the ICPSR summer program in cognitive methods on social research and also the Global School for Empirical Research Methods where he teaches advanced uh, courses in um, measurement, scaling, uh, and in general, uh, as you probably know, he's an expert in political psychology and is here to tell us about um, this very exciting topic of conspiracy theory, which I'm very much looking forward to. But in general, we should also just be glad that we have a leading figure here who's published in these very highly regarded outlets, very many of them, AJPS, American Journal of Political Science, Journal of Politics, British Journal of Political Science, Journal of Behavior, Political Communication, and something called the Harvard Journal of Misinformation, the most interesting of the uh, efforts. And then also, not just these uh, really well-regarded scholarly efforts, uh, Adam also does a lot of public-facing scholarship, writing for The Atlantic, um, The Washington Post, um, and has been interviewed at Langley Politica, which you can check out the interview on his webpage if you'd be interested. So, um, and it's like adamenders.com or something, right? Okay, So I'll turn it over to Adam so you can hear somebody more interesting. Thank you. Uh, thanks. And, and thanks for having me. Um, I love talking about conspiracy theories and conspiracy beliefs. Um, and, you know, like any researcher is happy to talk about the stuff they care about. But uh, I do think that this um, really does matter a lot right now, uh, given, given uh, where, where we are politically. Um, and uh, my, my sense as somebody who studies this uh, is that um, a lot of the uh, intuitions that people have and the bits of knowledge they have about conspiracy beliefs and sort of the basic, basic nature of conspiratorial thinking is a little bit off um, because coverage of it is not very good, uh, is, is one, one piece of that puzzle. Um, but I also want to admit that uh, this is a fairly new kind of area of research. So I did my dissertation on this and started writing it on uh, conspiracy beliefs around 2013, 2014. And there wasn't really a systematic research program, especially doing empirical work, until around 2010. So before then, it's uh, super idiosyncratic. I could count on two hands how many papers were published on conspiracy beliefs. Um, you know, not a coherent research program. None of that stuff built off each other or talked to each other. Um, and there is uh, pretty clear evidence that you know academics just thought, you know, conspiracy theories. Why would we study this? Uh, this is just for tinfoil-headed loons that are hanging out in their mom's basement, and this is not worthy of like serious academic pursuit. Uh, but then, you know, I think things started to sort of change uh, with 9/11 truth or conspiracy theories, and then Obama birther kind of. Conspiracy theories, and um, that's why we start to see this big uptick uh, in research in this area around uh, 2008, 2010. Uh, that's uh, only been sustained by uh, Donald Trump and uh, the pandemic, and uh, you know some other other worldwide things going on as well. So um, today, um, uh, I, I uh, I'd like to talk talk all about uh, the sort of basic nature of conspiracy thinking, but. Um, what I want to focus on and um, what I've been working on lately is trying to figure out how things are changing or not over time. So we all, I think, sort of have this inkling that um, things are different, right, than they were in the past, whatever that means, right? I don't know if that was five years ago or like pre-Trump or pre-social media or pre-internet or what, uh, but, but people seem to have this sense. And if you read coverage, um, if you look at um, the uh, opening paragraphs of research articles, uh, if you look at what politicians are saying before they uh, head into congressional hearings about uh, the impact of social media on, uh, on, on society, um, you know, you, you see those same kinds of things echo, right? Things uh, where we're devolving into this sort of uh, post-truth uh, society, right? 
Uh, conspiracy theories have never spread this quickly or not as deeply in the American psyche. Uh, journalists in particular love the golden age of conspiracy thinking. I think actually that interview you mentioned, they ended up titling it, We're in the Golden Age, which is not something I would have ever sanctioned. Because uh, if, if you, we can go back to like 1983 and find the golden age of conspiracy thinking in a major newspaper every single year. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit overblown. Uh, but this recent, uh, this recent article that was published in Nature just this year, uh, you know, makes this argument that uh, the study of uh, collective behavior uh, by which they're really sort of getting at uh, people's tendency to believe in or share misinformation and conspiracy theories and fake news, etc., should, uh, should be elevated to um, what they call a crisis discipline, uh, just like uh, medicine and conservation and climate science, right? So um, everybody's sort of on, on board with this idea that things are different and getting worse, maybe, uh, and trying to figure out what to do about it. And even the public agrees. So um, uh, I've got some polling data. This is a mixture of uh, CNBC polls, uh, you know, random probability poll polling, and uh, put So 73% of Americans believe that conspiracy theories are out of control. 59% uh, agree that people are more likely to believe conspiracy theories today than 25 years ago. And uh, over three quarters believe that social media and the internet are. Okay. So, uh, broad consensus uh, about this. And uh, to be sure, this matters, right? This is this is consequential, right? This is where we're not where we were ten plus years ago, where conspiracy theories are just you know these sort of flighty things that don't matter. Um, you know, at this point, even in, in 10 years or so, a pretty solid body of evidence has been built showing that conspiracy beliefs are positively associated with uh, all sorts of negative things, undesirable things. So uh, those include antisocial personality traits uh, like sociopathy and psychopathy and uh, narcissism and Machiavellianism, what uh, social psychologists call the dark triad. Uh, personality characteristics, so obviously sinister, um, and uh, you know also a sort of litany of, of uh, non-normative uh, behaviors like supporting political violence. Um, some people find that there's some correlation with criminality or, or a, a, a predisposition to sort of engage in physical conflict. Um, we found during the pandemic that people that uh, tend to express beliefs in uh, coronavirus conspiracy theories in particular were more likely uh, to, to engage in, in things like hoarding goods. It doesn't even really make sense, uh, depending on which conspiracy belief we're talking about. So uh, if you think it's fake, then you would be hoarding goods. But uh, if you think it's bioweapon, then maybe, uh, then maybe you would be hoarding goods. Um, and uh, we find that conspiracy beliefs are negatively associated with a whole bunch of things that we wish people would do, right? So um, positive health behaviors, like just regularly seeing a physician. So you know, a, a lot of this work is pre-pandemic, right? So this is not new. There were anti-vaxxers before the pandemic, especially when it comes to childhood vaccines for measles, mumps, and rubella, uh, and some other things. So uh, vaccination, um, you know, if, uh, if you believe in climate change kinds of conspiracy theories, you're not going to be taking steps to reduce your carbon footprint or uh, recycle or do some of those other kinds of things. So um, lots of potential negative consequences. This is super broad strokes. Not every conspiracy belief is correlated with all of these things. So uh, sort of an important aside is that um, you know, these beliefs are not sort of created equally. Uh, so uh, you know, pandemic stuff doesn't necessarily sort of predict violence, uh, uh, whereas uh, some other conspiracy um, but uh, we'll, we'll set that aside. Um, okay, so everybody, uh, everybody is sort of on board with this idea that things are worse uh, and getting worse, and we have lots of reason for concern. But the problem is that no one has really demonstrated that we are becoming more conspiratorial. So there is some limited amount of work that shows. You know, stability over you know a couple of waves, maybe of panel data, and you know one or two conspiracy beliefs. Um, there is certainly work uh, more in sort of the social media vein that uh, deals with uh, people sort of sharing 
conspiracy theories online, but it's unclear sort of how that maps to earlier social media days, pre-social media days, right? How, how do we actually sort of fit this together? Uh, is this a social media problem? Is it, you know, exclusively, or is it one at all? We just, we really don't have an answer to this. There's not really a single study that has set out to just answer this question, are we becoming more conspiratorial? Which strikes me as deeply problematic, uh, given how frequently we're repeating the claim, and a lot of, you know, serious measures that are being considered to uh, moderate content, uh, you know, potential sort of free speech implications, and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So, um, that's what we're going to look at. Um, before I uh, sort of jump into my data, I just want to, I find it useful to sort of distinguish some terms here because, again, we use, you know, conspiracy theory. It's sort of been integrated into political vernacular at this point, but uh, nobody really ever defines it, uh, and it is indeed really tricky to define, but uh, just to sort of pick these things apart a little bit so you know what I'm saying when I use, like, these specific terms. Um, I'm going to define conspiracy theory this way. Uh, some sort of accusation alleging that a powerful group is working in secret for their own benefit against the common good in a way that undermines norms, rules, or laws. Um, you know, we have uh, legal standards for conspiracy, but uh, when we're talking about conspiracy theories, we're not necessarily just talking about uh, you know, conspiracy to rob a liquor store or something. Uh, it, it, it can be more sort of norm-breaking than, than purely law. Um, so there's this sort of substantive component to, to the idea of conspiracy theory, but then there's also this sort of epistemological component as well, too, right? Because conspiracy theories are false, right? Uh, or false-ish, or they have some sort of relationship to the truth, right? We can't really talk about conspiracy theory without talking about the truth, so this is going to be an inherently sort of messy uh, endeavor. Uh, so, you know, when, when I'm defining this, uh, my sort of standard for uh, whether there is evidence in support uh, or not in support of a conspiracy theory uh, is very much the way we think about it when it comes to any scientific fact. So where do uh, experts tend to stand on this? Uh, that's also not always clean, right? There are questions about who's an expert and where the evidence is stacking up. Um, you know, science is, most people sort of think about it as a sort of inherently probabilistic kind of endeavor, right? So evidence hopefully stacks up in favor or or not so much uh, of a given theory or hypothesis over time, but most of the time we're in this gray area. So that's just sort of the nature of reality, not you being pedantic, uh, pedantic about what a conspiracy theory is. Um, okay, so that's how I think about um, conspiracy theories. Um, a conspiracy is just sort of a verified attempt, right, uh, at uh, what a conspiracy theory is. Right? So I guess we can think about like Watergate at some point being a conspiracy theory until the appropriate sort of epistemic authority figures in the investigation and figure out this, you know, this is warranted, uh, this conspiracy did actually occur, right? Or was um, a conspiracy theorist, I, I try not to use this term very much because it sort of dichotomizes the world, right? And people who are conspiracy theorists and people who aren't. Um, I'm not sure who should count as one uh, versus not, uh, uh, you know, is it, is it uh, believing one, uh, is it uh, believing ten, uh, is it, uh, you know, this, this gets a lot more complicated too when we start disagreeing on what counts as a conspiracy theory or not. So um, I think about this uh, the way a lot of, you know, uh, psychological constructs are conceptualized as it's a predisposition and, and what we're really getting at here is some sort of continuum where some people are sort of inherently more predisposed to interpret real-world events as the product of conspiracies uh, that have happened, and some people are just less likely to do that. Uh, why are some people more likely and other people less likely? A whole host of motivations go into that, political, social, and psychological. Um, I'm not going to get into that too much right now, although I'll return to it uh, toward, toward the end of the talk. So, um, the way to think about it is uh, continuum, and I think it sort of, just sort of matches up nicely with the way that we sort of think about evidence uh, and what is truth, um, uh, at least the way that I kind of think about it as uh, a social scientist. So uh, you know, the more evidence we have for some uh, proposition, the more likely we are to sort of call that a scientific fact. Uh, the less evidence, you know, uh, the less likely, likely we are to do that. 
Uh, and then the same thing with conspiracy theories. Um, and then uh, in, in many ways, uh, like I said, we have uh, this continuum along which we can orient people that we call uh, conspiratorial. Um, we tend to focus on the high end of conspiratorial thinking, although I would also pretend that the really low end is, is sort of problematic too. So we don't want people that are completely uncritical of uh, political institutions and think that politicians don't lie uh, or conspire because obviously that, that does happen sometimes. Uh, so it's another sort of feature of thinking about it as a continuum instead of dichotomizing into conspiracy theories or not. Okay, so um, how do we study these things? Um, two, two basic areas that I've already kind of mentioned. There's social media activity and then there's what I do, which is uh, survey-based research. Uh, you know, polling, uh, if you want to think about it that way. And there are pros and cons to, to both of these. So uh, with social media, it's nice because we can see what people choose to uh, like and share uh, and retweet. So you, there is some sort of behavioral element, right? People chose to do this thing uh, sort of unobserved, uh, which is uh, always a nice thing to be able to capture as a social scientist who's uh, dealing with something that uh, might have some uh, social desirability kind of issues, right? People, uh, some people are a little bit cagey about being monitored about uh, ideas that others find to be dubious or crazy or problematic. Although most people that are really high on conspiratorial thinking, they don't really care. Uh, they, they know that they're right and you're all just sort of sheeple bumping into each other in the fog of lies and whatever. So. Um, you know, they're more than happy to let you do that and know that they're more uh, moral and virtuous than you uh, and fighting the good fight. Um, cons, uh, lots of bots, right, and, and fake accounts poses a problem. Um, what, what does it mean to share something is, is somewhat problematic. So we know that people don't tend to really read articles. They sort of skim headlines. And then uh, oftentimes uh, uh, sort of uh, you know, the gut reaction is to just sort of share these things without thinking about them too much. Uh, they're not really necessarily interested in um, I don't know, convincing others or something like this. Um, and then there's a question about, you know, what the, what the denominator is with uh, social media kind of studies. Um, and, and more broadly, you know, what, what, who we can sort of generalize to from the sample, right? So a lot of the work on, uh, in the social media vein is based on Twitter because it's easy to gather tweets. Uh, and it's not so easy to do to, to gather Facebook content. But um, I'm not sure what, what the numbers look like in Canada and the US. It's somewhere between 20 and 30% of Americans are on Twitter, we think. Uh, we don't really know. So um, that's one problem. Uh, you know, are we generalizing to Twitter users or are we generalizing to the mass public or you know, adults or what? Um, the people on Twitter also appear to be systematically different than, than everybody else. Uh, and in particular, the people that engage in the most heated sort of political polarizing rhetoric online, they exhibit a lot of those sort of uh, undesirable characteristics that I mentioned earlier that, you know, conspiracy theorists share, the sort of narcissism and, and, and uh, uh, are inherently sort of more argumentative, which again, doesn't really extrapolate well. Uh, to, to the mass public. So, um, you know, there are, there are some cons to trying to uh, understand beliefs and motivations by looking at um, social media. Um, when it comes to survey research, uh, I think a pro is that we can ask people directly, you know, what they believe, rather than trying to infer the belief from the share or the re retweet or, or whatever. Um, and of course, we can sort of further probe those by getting at other kinds of characteristics. Um, and you can correlate uh, conspiracy beliefs with other uh, psychological and political and sociodemographic characteristics. Though, um, you know, the cons are just sort of the obvious polling cons, right? Uh, so uh, some people uh, are, might be uncomfortable answering uh, the questions. Um, you know, there are some issues with doing uh, polling and, and, and reaching uh, a truly representative sample, right, because of uh, people systematically sort of opting out of participation, especially uh, on the political right, it seems, um, at, least, uh, at least in the U.S. So, um, and then here I mentioned just sort of social desirability bias sometimes. People don't want to divulge 
uh, true beliefs if they sort of fear that they're going to be judged for those in some way. So uh, there are pros and cons. Uh, I want to be upfront about that. Um, what I'm going to do though is, is you know, sort of my wheelhouse, which is to look at some polling data. So uh, my proposal for trying to test this hypothesis, this uh, admittedly very loose and squishy and underparameterized hypothesis about spread and growing and, and whatever, uh, is to just sort of do the simplest kind of thing that I can do, right? Which is just look at conspiracy beliefs from time one to time two and go back as far as I possibly can. Um, which is not the easiest thing to do, given my preface about how no one's really been studying this systematically for very long. So we don't have a ton of uh, polling data on conspiracy beliefs before, you know, around that 2010 mark. But uh, there are some of them. Um, so what I think we need to have, uh, given that this, this theory is so sort of squishy, is is to sort of provide for as many kind of alternatives and, and potential problems and caveats and assumptions as we possibly can. So um, I want to have variation in uh, the types of conspiracy theories we're talking about. So we're talking about political figures or partisan political figures, uh, government malfeasance, health, aliens, uh, paranormal stuff. Oh, not all paranormal kind of things that uh, people think of being Bigfoot. It's not really a conspiracy theory. Uh, it's more of just sort of a supernatural belief. But um, uh, there are other ideas about government cover-ups um, regarding paranormal uh, ideas. Um, I want to have uh, a lot of variation in time span, right? So distance between time one and time two. Um, the salience of conspiracy theories, which again is sort of a squishy thing, but uh, presumably, you know, COVID. 19 conspiracy theories, if we're polling about them today, are more relevant than JFK assassination conspiracy theories, if we're going to poll about them today. So we want to have some variation in that day. Um, and then survey data, right? So phone and internet and face-to-face, -face, that might help us out with the, the social desirability problem. People are uh, more likely to divulge um, attitudes that they fear they're going to be judged about when they're not speaking to someone directly. Uh, than when they are, uh, even if that's uh, over the telephone. And so um, the, the test is simple, right? Compare the proportion of people who believe in a given conspiracy theory at time one with that at time two, and see if it's increased, decreased, or stayed about the same. Um, so the primary data that I have uh, comes from a May 2021 survey that we did of a little over 2,000 American adults uh, it's designed to be uh, reflective of the population based on gender, race, age, and educational attainment according to U.S. Census data. Um, we do all the normal sort of quality assurances when it comes to people speeding through the survey, lots of different uh, attention checks and uh, that kind of stuff to ensure the quality of the data. And then what we did was, um, so me and my co-author, who I should have mentioned, his name was on the first slide, Joe Yusinski at the University of Miami. Um, uh, between he and I, we've got a good amount of data spanning back to about 2012. So we can, we can track uh, a bunch of different beliefs back to about 2012, which I think is getting pretty much pre-social media the way we know it today. So I, I remember I started sort of paying attention to this because uh, around the time that Reddit was sort of becoming a thing and where Alex Jones hopped to YouTube and really started monetizing the channel, right? So 2012 would have been pretty much before then. Um, but we wanted to have, we wanted to go back even farther than that, right? As far as we possibly did. So um, the Roper Center has a really nice uh, database of publicly available polling data. And so we just sort of scoured that for every conspiracy belief uh, question that we could possibly find. And so um, the oldest we have goes back to 1966. And so we just straight up replicated all of those questions, right, exactly as they were asked. Um, and then, you know, we've got some other older things about uh, MLK assassination and uh, the government having killed John Lennon and Tupac Shakur, uh, Reagan making uh, deals with the Iranians to hold hostages after uh, he was able to win the election, and FDR knowing about the Pearl Harbor attack. So, um, a bunch of uh, a bunch of sort of older things uh, that maybe aren't so salient today, but again, um, that's the data that was around then. 
Um, and then I've got a bunch of other ancillary data. So that first, that primary data set, we've got, um, I don't know, maybe 45 conspiracy beliefs that we look at between two different time points at least. Uh, but then I have three other texts of this proposition. So um, this is coming from a mixture of a thousand plus respondent uh, surveys that were done by Qualtrics or YouGov as part of the, um, the uh, semi-annual CCES, Cooperative Congressional Election Study. Um, and that data is from 2012 up to 2020. And so we've got additional specific conspiracy belief questions. We've got questions about uh, which groups are most likely to conspire against the rest of us. So sort of trying to change the measurement of conspiracism a little bit from specific beliefs to who do you believe the conspirators are. Um, and then we've got questions that are designed to tap that general predisposition toward conspiratorial thinking. So getting us away from the content of specific groups um, and, uh, and, and, and all the other sort of trappings of specific conspiracy beliefs and just getting to uh, the tendency. And we have some comparative data too that was um, conducted by YouGov in 2016 and 2018 in uh, Great Britain, Sweden, Germany, Poland, Italy, and Portugal. So it's not a ton of data, it's not a ton of time points, but we can kind of compare 2016 to 2018. Uh, and some big things happened uh, between 2016 and 2018. So Brexit uh, falls in the middle of that, uh, Trump falls in the middle of that when we hold. Uh, in 2016, so um, there are some sort of focal events that come in between those two happens. Okay, so um, I'll uh, sort of zoom in on a couple of these to start, and then I'll show a horrible table of a bunch of other things that we can skip through and I can give you the broad strokes. Uh, so this is um, COVID, uh, a couple of COVID conspiracy beliefs in particular. So the first one there is coronavirus purposely created and released by powerful people as part of the conspiracy. And then the second one has to do with the threat of coronavirus being exaggerated to hurt Donald Trump. And uh, we had that, uh, we managed to get a uh, survey in the field really quickly in 2020 in March. And so we had that uh, in uh, March, in June, October uh, of 2020, and then uh, the one uh, about uh, coronavirus spread on purpose. Uh, the Trump one didn't quite make as much sense in uh, May of 2021, given the election results. Uh, so we have those over time, and, and we don't really find much change in those, right? So uh, we couldn't have really pulled on them before March. Uh, that would have been pretty tricky to do. But um, we're, we're finding pretty much stability over the span of the pandemic thus far. So, um, I've got a couple of other conspiracy theories, and then uh, we sprinkled in a couple of pieces of misinformation just for good measure, uh, given that everybody's sort of focused on COVID now. Uh, so we've got you know, Bill Gates and a dangerous vaccine and uh, installing tracking devices. And so um, uh, these are all comparing between June of 2020 and May of 2021. And the most important thing is what is the difference between those two, the difference in proportion uh, and or percentage. Uh, and then whether that's statistically significant. And so uh, looking at this table, we only find one increase, um, and that is the number of deaths related has been exaggerated, uh, and we found that that went up seven points between June of 2020 and uh, May of 2020. Um, a couple of uh, the others are not significant, um, but we have some more significant decreases than we have increases. Um, might want to sort of zoom in on QAnon uh, for a second too, given that this was sort of a big thing last year, especially after uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, a U.S. representative uh, from Georgia, won her primary. That's when QAnon coverage sort of went ballistic, uh, because she's the sort of quintessential QAnon candidate. Um, we actually uh, asked uh, questions about QAnon in uh, 2019 and 2018, which uh, I think to our knowledge nobody else did uh, the earliest sort of on questions we saw from uh, March of 2020. Um, so we, we initially uh, asked this as a feeling thermometer question, uh, which is maybe not ideal, but it's, it's what we did back then. Um, so uh, a feeling thermometer ranges from 0 to 100. 100 is very positive feelings. 0 is very negative feelings. would be sort of neutral. And we asked people to place the QAnon movement on that scale. 
And so uh, probably people know something about QAnon at this point, but uh, this, this pretty much sums up the core of QAnon. So it's a belief that some high level security, uh, uh, someone in the uh, US sort of security official was communicating with the American people under the pseudonym Q about Donald Trump's battle with the deep state. Uh, originally on uh, this image board called 4chan, and then I moved to 8chan, and 8chan turned into 8 code, and uh, that's not important. Um, that's sort of the core belief of QAnon. A lot of other things sort of get pegged to QAnon. Um, maybe, maybe they're QAnon, maybe they're not. Uh, so there's mole children and adrenochrome, uh, which is some sort of chemical that uh, supposedly Democrats in particular are interested in that children have that uh, has restorative properties. It's basically like if you've ever seen the movie uh, Hocus Pocus, uh, with that learn where they like suck the life force from the children, it's that. Uh, <laughs> there's uh, satanic baby eaters, there's the return of JFK Jr., uh, who they're super interested in. There was a whole gathering in Dallas uh, just uh, about a month ago where people were awaiting the return of JFK Jr. Um, and then uh, the, the child trafficking, right? Uh, which that has sort of roots going back at least to the comic ping pong pizza game kind of deal, but uh, it turns out people are just really uh, sort of interested in, in child trafficking and people stealing children, and it sort of goes back really to like blood libel kinds of ideas. Um, it's just this thing that sort of, I don't know, uh, uh, grips people uh, in, uh, I don't know, culture for some reason. Anyway. Um, those things, some of you not people believe those things, some people don't, yeah, that's, that's all sort of a mess, this is the poor thing. In any case, um, we find that there's not really a lot of movement over time, um, and to the extent that there is some, it's, it's actually completely down. Um, so the Pew Research Center did a really interesting poll uh, in March uh, that they repeated in September of 2020, where they asked people if they had heard of QAnon. And then if they had heard of QAnon, where they heard about it from. And so in March, not very many people had heard of QAnon. So um, you know, where we're finding this dip, there's actually this big increase in people who have actually heard of it, right? So by September of 2020, a ton of people have heard of QAnon. And in their poll, uh, the organization that most of them heard about QAnon from was the New York Times, right? So it's you know the coverage is sort of feeding this beast, right? Otherwise, nobody would really know or care about QAnon. It would just be um, you know, thousands of people, tens, hundreds, maybe, uh, but probably somewhat secluded uh, in, their, in their little corner of the internet. Um, but in any case, um, that's what that trend looks like. We asked about some of those other ideas that are sort of floating around QAnon. Um, so the, the general sort of deep state idea, uh, elites from government and Hollywood are engaged in a massive child sex trafficking racket. By the way, just to call your attention to that number, that's not a French belief. <laughs> um, and we've repeated this a couple of different times and we played with this question wording. It's like 30% or so of people believe that. So um, again, uh, we, we kind of think that that has to do with, um, uh, certainly uh, in the States, there is always um, uh, coverage about child trafficking. It's just like a winning issue for politicians, especially local politicians when they can say they they busted somebody trying to steal a child out of a parking lot or something like this, and they get to do the public service announcements about watch out for white vans and, and the Walmart parking lot and whatever. Uh, it's just sort of a regular occurrence. Uh, but there's also you know, high profile kind of stuff, right? Epstein um, and uh, Anthony Weiner in, in the US and, and, and lots of others in, in, in politics and in, in Hollywood. Uh, uh, lots of examples. Uh, and then Epstein, every, everybody thinks that somebody killed Epstein, so that's, uh, this is one of the, the higher ones that we sort of hit, uh, other, than, other than JFK, I would say that would be the, the second highest that, um, uh, that finds the most support in the government. Okay, so again, uh, in this case, we're not finding any significant differences, there's not a lot of movement here uh, between uh, time one and time two, which is, uh, time one's a little bit different across those. Okay, so here's the big nasty table that I promised. Uh, that has, I think, 37 other conspiracy, specific conspiracy theories. So, um, you know, we can see here's, you know, JFK, 66, um, uh, which actually seems to have maybe gone up a little bit, that specific question wording at least. Uh, although, um, 
some versions of the JFK question actually reached 80s in, um, by the late 70s and early 80s. So uh, this, is, this is not uh, an upper bound, um, uh, or, or that's not an upper bound, frankly, for um, what the, the Kennedy conspiracy beliefs look like. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these. Uh, we can see, again, this is sort of the important columns over here. Uh, we find some that have increased. Uh, we find a lot that are pretty minor increases or decreases that are not uh, statistically significant. Um, and then we find uh, some decreases as well. So of the 37, just in this table, this three-part table, um, six showed an increase in magnitude from four to 10 points. 16 showed no significant change over time. And 15 showed a statistically significant decrease uh, ranging in magnitude from three to 31 points. And the average change uh, across all of these was negative four and a half uh, percent. So um, we tried to sort of push on this a little harder, uh, given that this is obviously at odds with what people are saying. Um, so we thought maybe it has something to do with the sort of age of the conspiracy theory, right? So uh, we looked at the amount of time between um, the, the, you know, whatever time one is and, and time two, and tried to correlate that with the percent change. And uh, that didn't really work out. Uh, it, it turns out that that time, uh, at least between one and two, doesn't have much to do with it. Um, we tried to sort of get at salience by just looking at what was time point one. So is it just that we have these big decreases in things that sort of people don't care about anymore? And uh, that, didn't, that didn't work out either. So I think actually that's, uh, that was uh, in the opposite of uh, what it should have been. So um, that didn't work out either. Uh, and so again, you know, with those, uh, we're trying to sort of get at, um, you know, potential caveats here, or, um, you know, there's this sense, I think, that maybe, um, you know, the number of people that are glomming onto these initially is higher than it would have been with some other conspiracy theory initially in the past. And so, uh, you know, it's sort of an imperfect way of getting at that, but we're not really finding much evidence for it. Okay, so that's sort of study one of this. Um, second, we looked at um, those conspiracy beliefs across countries. So we have six different conspiracy beliefs that have to do with um, uh, things that would translate well across political cultures. So we asked about um, the AIDS virus and alien contact, uh, a general thing about um, elites uh, controlling the world. Uh, it's, it's conspiratorial content. The specific question we're going to have, we can look at later. Uh, global warming, immigrants, Holocaust denial. And across uh, these 35 comparisons, we can't ask about Holocaust denial in Germany. Uh, across these 35, uh, only one of them actually went up, and it was the Holocaust denial one in Sweden, from 1% to 3%. Um, and we had seven significant decreases, and then in the remaining 27 cases, there, were no, there was no so again, uh, it's not the test, it's not the perfect test, right? Uh, I would like to be able to go back much further, but um, again, there were some sort of intervening factors between 2016 and 2018 that we might have thought would etch this up, especially like the, the, the immigration um, conspiracy theory that we asked about. Um, the conspirators question. So we asked, which of the following groups is likely to work in secret against the rest of us? Uh, and uh, respondents were able to check all that apply, and we have that back to 2012. And these are the groups that we asked about here. We did find um, significant increases between 2012 and 2020 in uh, six cases, and decreases in three. Um, the decreases are larger in magnitude than the increases, though, uh, if we sort of slice it that way. Or if we uh, look at just a count of how many groups people were picking, we found that there was no uh, significant difference between 2012 and 2020, uh, whereas uh, 2.56 and 2.7. So um, there's a little bit more maybe supportive evidence um, in this case, uh, given this uh, second bullet point that we had in the past. Um, though um, just sort of eyeballing this, it seems to be kind of a mess, right? There's not like an obvious trend, right? Uh, where, where these beliefs, uh, or, or the conspirators that people are picking are, are increasing over time. 
And then the final test was looking at the general predisposition, um, which, uh, again, this is sort of a scale of four questions that are designed to tap into uh, people's tendency to uh, view the world in this conspiratorial lens. Um, the, the questions, you know, scale together really well. Uh, we've been using them for a while, and we have that back to 2012. And so on, on the scale of, of uh, one to five, uh, we see that there's really, there's really no movement going on here either. Um, and uh, technically, uh, the 2021 levels are lower uh, statistically than the 2012 levels, although it's, it's by so small that I wouldn't make that big difference. Make it Okay, so um, I guess the big question left is, is why, right? Uh, so this, this doesn't comport with, with what people um, have been saying and what uh, many of our sort of gut reactions are. Um, you know, again, we, we try to sort of push, uh, hammer on this data as much as we possibly could uh, to see if we can figure out what's going on here or if we're just sort of uh, missing something. Um, other than some of the other obvious caveats that I've given. So um, the, the question, I guess, is going back to the drawing board and think about, thinking about why, you know, why might we not expect uh, increases to be occurring over time. So um, the, the, first, the first one, I guess, is that you know, people have reasons for believing in conspiracy theories. They're not good reasons, uh, necessarily. Uh, they're not conscious reasons. Um, and, and many of these reasons, these motivations, they're not different than really other beliefs, right? Um, but, you know, people don't just sort of bump into these things and sort of magically believe them. They, you know, they, they have these sort of political and social and psychological ingredients and motivations that make these kinds of explanations for things that happen in the world attractive to them. And that's not new, right? Uh, the, the pandemic didn't cause that, um, and, and Donald Trump uh, presumably did cause that. So uh, we know that partisan identities and ideological goals are really important, right? Ideological goals, thinking about limiting uh, the efforts it would take to limit the impact of climate change. Uh, partisan identities, right? We like in groups, we dislike out groups, so we're more than happy to glom on the conspiracy theories that impugn the out group and that, you know, trump up the in group. Um, with uh, social motivations, um, uh, first of all, it, you know, it, it's worth noting that some, some groups have actually been the subjects of actual conspiracies. Uh, so it would make sense um, how some of that is sort of uh, baked in. But uh, other kinds of in-group, out-group kinds of uh, prejudices against religious groups, right? Uh, Anti-Semitism is pretty prevalent in conspiracy theories. Um, uh, but, you know, racial groups uh, and uh, class, uh, other sorts of in-group, out-group dynamics drive conspiracy beliefs. Um, and then lots and lots of different um, uh, psychological hardwiring, essentially, right? So we're prone to confirmation bias. We like, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're prone to uh, patternicity. We see patterns, uh, even though it's, it's just sort of coincidence or it's just noise. Uh, we, we sort of cherry-pick evidence. Um, we are prone to the conjunction fallacy, which is believing that the joint probability of two things happening is somehow greater than the probability of individual events, um, and, uh, and, and lots of other things in this vein that make us really bad at reasoning about the world and getting the truth, right? So, like science, uh, what, what you all do is, um, is designed to try and limit those things, right? Uh, whereas with conspiracy theories, they're just sort of on full, full blast. So uh, we all engage in, in, in these sorts of uh, uh, psychological pitfalls to some degree or another, and of course, uh, many of them do encourage uh, conspiratorial um, The other thing uh, that we need to consider is selective exposure, right? So how people interact with information online. And, you know, we, we all know that Democrats don't watch Fox News, right? <laughs> And uh, uh, or, you know, pe people on the left are not going to be consuming sort of uh, this right-leaning information. Um, and you know, in the U.S., uh, you know, Republicans aren't going to be watching MSNBC. But for some reason, when it comes to online, we just—I don't know—if people just don't think those rules apply anymore, or uh, people are just more likely to sort of bump into things, and they're not actually 
fairly specifically choosing the kind of content that they're interested in. Of course, algorithms, you know, the, the way that social media content is sort of fed to us is, is designed, it you know, throws a little bit of a kink into this, but it, it's primarily driven by our preferences, right? So, you know, we can look at the stories of, uh, well, this person is sort of get drawn more and more into QAnon content over time, but again, if, if you're not sort of predisposed to seeing the world this way, you would reject that. And my evidence for that is literally everyone sitting here, right? Uh, like everyone, here, like nobody here has magical powers where you are really good at like being online and you keep walking away not crazy every time, but other people somehow it gets them, right? Uh, so this isn't like magic, right? Uh, people choose choose the content that is interesting to them, and and you know so we find lots of evidence that uh, people engage in, in selective exposure or selective avoidance um, when it comes to uh, looking at conspiratorial information and misinformation online just like they do with other kinds of media choices. So um, just uh, one piece of this uh, evidence, so um, we've got the correlation between uh, how frequently individuals use each of these platforms and then support for the QAnon movement. And um, you know, as we would probably expect, uh, that correlation is significant across the board. And it increases as we go, you know, sort of from Facebook and Twitter, mainstream kind of platforms, to 4chan and 8chan down here. Uh, and uh, for a time, at least, QAnon was actually pretty big on Instagram, uh, and then in YouTube before it got uh, booted uh, post, uh, post January 6th. But um, those correlations are pretty, are, are contingent, right? They're conditional on, you know, one's predisposition to sort of see the world in so if you're really low in uh, conspiratorial thinking, then spending a lot of time on Facebook is not going to uh, result in you uh, turning into a QAnon acolyte, uh, most likely. So um, I think we have some reasons to, to expect that maybe, uh, I don't know, all of this data isn't somehow wrong. Um, you know, conspiracy beliefs aren't new. Uh, the motivations and individual level characteristics that feed them are really not new. Um, the information environment is somewhat new, but uh, it's not like lies and propaganda and disinformation are new. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think in many ways, um, you know, just past work on how people get information. Um, and, and where beliefs come from would actually sort of lead us to expect more stability and change in conspiracy beliefs. Um, and then I'll, I'll sprinkle in a little bit of, of my take on this. Uh, again, I think a lot needs to be done still, but um, I think in terms of at least sort of the coverage of, uh, media coverage of we're becoming more conspiratorial is, um, you know, painting social media as this boogeyman when maybe it's just sort of a different kind of mirror into human behavior than we had been used to, uh, because people just say what they think out loud, right, um, in, in ways that, um, you know, uh, just didn't happen or were different uh, before. And so I think if that's the case, and, I, and maybe even more generally in light of some of these findings, uh, we might want to recalibrate and rethink some of the efforts uh, that uh, researchers are undertaking to, um, to try and, and deal with this. So uh, a lot of, uh, in, in the misinformation, uh, in misinformation research, there's, um, there, uh, there are these sort of strategies that have to do with uh, pre-bunking and debunking information. And uh, so the idea is sort of get ahead of it and, and sort of almost inoculate people like a vaccine, say this is a claim that's going on, but this is why it's wrong. That would be the sort of pre-bunking side. The, the debunking side, which is easier to do, though much less efficacious, uh, is to say, well, here's the correct information, right, from the correct epistemic authority figure, the CDC or something like this. That, that work tends to find really limited effects because it's not taking seriously the fact that these people, they're part of the conspiracy, right? So exposing them to so-called quality authoritative information isn't going to do anything, right? Um, but there's the sense that maybe we can do this because it's not taking seriously the idea that people have you know, these reasons for believing these things. Again, not good reasons, but reasons. They didn't just sort of bump into them online and 
come out crazy on the other end. Uh, so it's making sort of correcting these things a lot more difficult. Um, and then I think that maybe uh, you know information technology matters a little bit less than uh, the, the broader shape of political discourse, especially when it comes to sort of top-down elite influences, right? And so to me, like one of the most important things that political scientists know is that public opinion is substantially a reflection of and reaction to elite discourse, right? Uh, it's a total mirror of that thing, of that. So uh, if you have uh, Donald Trump and a whole bunch of people on you know, the political right in the US saying that the election was stolen, then it's not too terribly surprising. It, it shouldn't be, I think, to any public opinion researcher that that gets reflected uh, really heavily in, uh, in, in public opinion. Um, and, and so, you know, the same thing goes with other kinds of conspiracy theories, and so, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to make light of this. Uh, I think the information environment matters, but it has a lot more to do with what, uh, what the sort of authority figures and politicians, especially in a polarized environment, are saying. Uh, maybe more so than the sort of predisposition uh, toward conspiracy thinking. Okay, so I'll uh, stop there, and uh, thanks, and I welcome your question.